Okay, we'll, uh, we'll get started. Um, my name is uh, Tom O'Callaghan. Uh, I'm an Irish GP and I'm the CEO of the IHEED uh, Institute in Ireland. Um, you're very welcome. We have many friends here in, in the room and some people we obviously haven't met before, but we're delighted to everybody here for this uh, very important and exciting discussion on uh, health workforce capacity building uh, in the developing world with particular, particular focus on sub-Saharan Africa. So the background is very simple. We all know the facts. Um, most of you here develop um, a lot of work in this area. There's a billion people on the planet who still have no access to, to any healthcare worker. Um, and there continues to be uh, eight to nine million children die every year from simple treatable conditions. And 350,000 mothers still die from complications of pregnancy and childbirth. We cannot build uh, the universities fast enough. We can't build the medical schools fast enough. We can't build the infrastructure fast enough. Um, a couple of bleak statistics. We train 176,000 doctors in Europe every year for a population of a, of a billion. In Africa, the total uh, training is 5,000 doctors for a similar population of a billion. So 176,000 uh, versus five. Um, so there's an urgent need to train millions of healthcare workers, and we've put figures on that. And we, you know, we, we blandly uh, trot out you know a new initiative for for one million community health workers, or uh, etc. And if we look back at what has been trained to date over the past 20 years, approximately 500,000 community health workers have been trained across sub-Saharan Africa over a period of 20 years and, and, and at a very high financial cost. And we now have a, a really exciting opportunity and an opportunity that brings us all here together. We have 700 million mobile phones across Africa. We have cheap tablets coming out of India for $35. And we have 5 billion mobile phones globally, so we have a, a real game-changing opportunity uh, to use mobile technology to train people in new, exciting ways. And we have a billion people on Facebook. We've got 300 million people on Skype, so aspirations to train another 100 community health workers or another 1,000 community health workers or another 10,000 community health workers seem very bland when you look at um, scale, the scale that's being achieved by, by other technology ventures. So it's a very exciting opportunity and there's been a lot of movement even in the past 12 months since we were all here last year. And we have a very exciting panel to discuss uh, some of the work that's been done in the past 12 months and some of the exciting opportunities. Alan is going to speak first and Alan is, is one of the great advocates for mobile health. Some of you may have heard him speak in different panels here this morning already. Um, he's on faculty at John Hopkins. He leads out John Hopkins mobile health initiatives. Um, and Alan has been a particular proponent and has a particular interest in the use of mobile health to facilitate uh, timely interventions in emergency care, particularly in the first month of life where there's the largest burden, burden of, of death. Uh, Alan is Bangladeshi by origin and uh, he often speaks about that he nearly was one of those statistics which would have been a huge, a huge loss to us, to John Hopkins and particularly his wife. Uh, <laughs> So um, the other thing is, he, his star sign is Gemini. Um, uh, his favorite color is apple green, and, uh, and he keeps pigeons as a hobby. So I'll pass you over to Alan. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Tom. Where's the Blarney Stone again? <laughs> no, it's a, it's a real pleasure to be here. And, uh, um, I'm not sure how much of that is true and how much is made up, but... Uh, it's good for the, the ecosystem. Now, I guess we wave the wand at the thing and have it come up. Fantastic. Great. So, you know, we've been talking about frontline health workers, evidence, and how do we scale what we know works to reach the bottom billion of the world's population as we try to achieve uh, MDGs. Now, in public health, we like to think of this as, as really the health part of the M health equation. And we have public health interventions of known efficacy. For the past 40 years, we've been conducting on the ground rigorous research to identify ways in which we can reduce mortality in the neonate and in the perinatal period. So we have guidances from WHO, from PMNCH, from other global bodies that define very clearly those packages of interventions that are known to save lives when, in, when instituted at the right time across the community, community level, the outreach level, the referral and district level, these are strategies which aren't so much challenging in their implementation. These are simple solutions that save lives. Wrapping, delaying uh, 
delaying the bathing of a child shortly after birth, the uh, assurance of thermal stability shortly after a baby is born in a rural, popu uh, rural uh, environment. But the challenge is how do we get these efficacious interventions to be implemented at scale in a timely fashion where and when they're needed in contexts like this where in rural Bangladesh and India between 60 and 85 percent of the deliveries occur in the home far removed from the facilities which we'd like them to eventually be born in. So we've been redefining mHealth over the past couple of years from thinking about mHealth as a specific strategy I apologize for the, the technology not wanting to work with us, but uh, we'll just stick with this. Uh, not so much as a, the M Health itself, but as a catalyst of health system interventions. So ideally what we want to do is take interventions of known efficacy and see them reach effective coverage. That is, that they're administered at the level of quality and with the spread they need to have the impact within a given population. But along the way of this implementation, we run into obstacles, we run into constraints, failure to follow guidelines at the grassroots level, drug or supply stockouts, lack of performance or training at the, at the frontline level or maintenance of that training over time. And so the way we perceive mHealth and the way we've now begun to, to evaluate and measure the impact of mHealth is as a mechanism to bridge these gaps that occur between us achieving effective coverage of those known effective interventions. Frontline health workers are plagued by ledger after ledger. Anyone who's worked in rural India, Zambia, or, or Bangladesh knows that a community health worker often carries around five to 10 kilograms of ledgers, each for a different department, monitoring and recording a different n number of indicators, which ultimately aren't put to good use for uh, policy and practice. So, you know, we talk a lot in the domestic arena here at this uh, summit about meaningful use and how do we get M Health to be used for meaningful use uh, integration. But I think the same term can be used for our purposes in global health. How do we meaningfully use all of this information using uh, strategic M Health systems? The way that frontline health workers are expected to collect data is very burdensome. It doesn't fit naturally within their existing workflow. We also have been, for the past 30 years, I, I don't know if you guys can do something about this jumping around, but that would be fantastic. We're making them nauseous. Um, the one-way data flow issue is something that, that concerns everyone. The fact that frontline health workers never get that feedback about the data that they're collecting, the performance that they're uh, ultimately contributing to, or the fact that they are in fact part of a broader health system is something that we haven't realized. We also find that continuity of care, something that we take for granted here in the domestic world, is something that we don't see applied to rural populations. It's now with this technology possible to bring concepts like continuity of care to populations that are often disconnected in remote settings. But family health, uh, frontline health workers are also sometimes thought to be untrustworthy, partially because of the quality of the data that comes up to the aggregate level when we, when we look at these reports. There's sometimes the su suspicion of creative reporting because of the si sheer burden of, of the expectations that are placed on those health workers. And it's also very time consuming. The time that a frontline health worker spends filling out the forms and ledgers and then aggregating that data takes away from the time that he or she could spend actually working and interacting with uh, clients. And then ultimately the biggest tragedy of all is the fact that these data do not end up impacting quality of care in most of the settings in which we work. <coughs> Just taking a look at this ANC register from, uh, from Karnataka, the, the sheer data value loss in this kind of information and you think about the, the inches and inches of paper that have been generated collecting information like this, where it's, it's virtually impossible now to follow a single patient over the course of her pregnancy or history. So this concept that data collection, service delivery, and reporting are three separate functions is actually a false dichotomy. We have to now think about how mobile solutions can, can enable us to create integrated family frontline health worker solutions we have to stop thinking about community health workers as a stopgap stop measure. In many countries, they are often seen as that 
that last line of defense because of the limited resources and the limited facility uh, accessibility that we have to prevent crises from occurring. But in fact, they're part of that chain of referral. They're part of that early recognition of crisis to facilitate referrals up the chain. And you'll see how we, in, we and others have tried to implement those principles in some of the interventions that we've been testing. Now we ask also ourselves about how do we evaluate these systems? How do we measure does it work in a CHW or FHW context? And one way to do this is to deconstruct a generic health worker's task flow. <laughs> From, yeah, this is my punishment. I think there's a leprechaun or something in this thing. <laughs> but uh, I'll stop with the Irish jokes. But uh, the, uh, the, the, the beginning of the health worker's job is, is of course, to receive training and to uh, be able to update that training as information comes available. We also want that health worker to conduct surveillance, to identify some target population such that she can offer those services to the, the individuals who form her denominator. There's also the issue of registration. How do you identify then those, say, who are pregnant, who require special added services beyond the generic uh, baseline services that are being offered? And then, of course, there is the, the documentation of interactions between that frontline health worker and her client base. And so throughout this, I've put in some, some red example performance indicators that can form the indicator basis to measure the impact of these strategies on improving the efficiencies of a community health system that relies heavily on those frontline health workers to deliver high quality care. Now, we've also tried to do is deconstruct Deconstruct M Health into. <laughs> it's good to have a sense of humor, but uh, deconstruct M Health into its component functions. So where we try to identify what, how do we as M Health researchers articulate what it is we're trying to do to a Ministry of Health or to a project program implementer. Often we've heard this from many of the individuals we work with, the projects we work with. Ministries of Health perceive an M Health stakeholder coming into the room as a vendor, that we're coming in trying to hawk a product or a solution or a technology, when actually what it is we're trying to do is speak the same language of those who are supervising and implementing frontline health worker programs. So what we're really trying to do is speak to them across these 10 signal functions, where we're helping them to optimize pieces of that broader health system that they're trying to implement in a given country, ranging from registration all the way to real-time indicator reporting. Now, I'll just run through a few examples of solutions that have tried to take a systems approach, solutions that are working at a macro level to integrate the workflow across the, the soup to nuts of what a community health worker does. This example of uh, Project Drishti is a reproductive maternal and newborn child health solution being used in, <laughs> you know, I should provide you all with the slides electronically later so you can uh, offer this is a solution that covers the, the continuum of care. So if you see here the uh, RMNCH continuum of care going from pre-pregnancy all the way to childhood, there are different windows of opportunity where mobile technologies can be used to optimize process across this continuum. But what's important throughout this process is, of course, that there's a data layer, that we're now creating a system that can provide that con continuity of care for an individual that's enrolled before pregnancy all the way through childhood. And these are the kinds of systems that governments are looking for, enterprise solutions that integrate the thousand flowers that have bloomed in M Health over the past five to 10 years into a bouquet of solutions that can be integrated across an enterprise. It's given us the courage to develop solutions in Bangladesh that try to address the question of can we proactively respond to situations before they became, become crises. So knowing about gestational age, for example, of a pregnant woman allows us to then react appropriately before a, a neonate goes into crisis if we know that newborn is a preterm birth. So we're now currently testing this in uh, rural Gaibanda in the north of uh, Bangladesh. But just the simple efficiency that we all gain from having these mobile phones manage our day-to-day -day calendars. How many of you in the audience use a calendar application on your phone to keep you on task on a daily basis? 
So imagine that simple functionality now transferred to a frontline health worker who has to deal with three to four to five thousand clients in one in one central location. I mean, I, I can hardly keep track of my 15 students, let alone 4,000 clients who would I have to deal with using a paper-based strategy. So we're actually trying in Bangladesh to create an e-registry system for frontline health workers to manage their workflow to move from this paradigm to a paradigm where they have access to individual information in the palm of their hands. Comcare, many of you are familiar with the, the solutions that Comcare has been uh, working with. Developing strategies to standardize the approach that community health workers can take to counseling and uh, teaching frontline uh, clients about different danger signs during pregnancy and necessary actions that they should take during this course. And so as the individuals walk through these, these stages of pregnancy, there's actually audio that is played back to each of the people they're trying to counsel, giving them the same message across deployment across vast areas of uh, intervention by the public health system. DTREE has taken a different approach, standardizing the algorithms, such as IMCI, the Integrated Management of Childhood Illness, putting those algorithms onto mobile phones to allow frontline health workers to follow those protocols in a, a high-fidelity a high way. So as you go through IMCI, one of the, the challenges in the literature for looking at the impact of, of IMCI as a, as a strategy is that it's very, very challenging to follow. There are some algorithms that, that have to be followed in order for it to reach maximum eff efficacy. And putting it on a mobile phone, here you see one of its first deployments on a Palm Pilot, actually has substantial improvements in the adherence to those protocols in uh, resource challenge settings. BBC Media Action has taken a completely different approach to targeting frontline health workers and their tasks. And similar to the DTREE concept, this is taking a platform agnostic approach where mothers can actually send an SMS to a given number appropriate to that stage of pregnancy and then get a voice recording that counsels them in, a, in, a, in an entertaining way about that particular health message that's being uh, transmitted. This is called mobile kunji because it looks like a set of keys with about 100 different pages, each linked to a unique voice file about that, uh, that strategy. Many of you just came from the session where uh, Jeff Sachs was presenting, and Millennium Villages had done a phenomenal job with their Child Count Plus strategy, basically showing that you can create this continuity, continuity of care for children who are being tracked for malnutrition and being able to, at the front line level, know when a child is tracking up or down based on their nutritional status and then act on that is a phenomenal tool that Frontline SMS and, and Child Count were able to uh, develop. At Johns Hopkins, our colleague who's in the audience here, uh, where's Bob? There he is. Bob Bollinger has been leading this, this uh, eMOCA project, which, which now has deployments across multiple countries in the world, really creating robust training and, and quality management tools for frontline health workers, not just to ensure that the, the, the frontline health workers have the state-of-the-art knowledge to act in fields such as HIV or malaria or TB counseling, but also that they can have access to resources that maintain their level of training and quality over time. So there are a few recommendations and cautions that I'm going to end with. One of these is the, the, is the, the essential need for detailed workflow mapping. I apologize. Workflow mapping and uh, mirroring. So when you try to integrate a new system into an existing health system framework, the, the closer you can, you can implement your strategy to the existing mode of delivery of care, to the existing workflow that that frontline health worker is used to delivering, the more efficacious we have found those interventions to be. But it's also critical to engage the end user both in the design and the testing of your intervention. Now, there's two end users. One is the ministries or the implementers that are going to take your program and implement it at scale, but there's also the end user, the frontline health worker, who ultimately has to adopt these practices as their standard uh, methods. We use paper prototyping as a mechanism to, to really understand whether or not we're in line with what that frontline health worker would feel comfortable with implementing at the field level. So top and bottom stakeholder inclusion is critical. It's also critical to build 
closing the loop strategies into your system so that there are feedback mechanisms that give that frontline health worker feedback on their performance and also contextualize how they perform in relation to the other individuals within their, uh, their peer group. We also need to address reporting and accountability needs. Ministries of Health, NGOs all have performance indicators that they either have to report to their donors, their board of trustees, or to the ministries themselves. And it's important that these systems be able to feed those indicators to those stakeholders so that they find maximum utility of those systems. So taking this holistic systems approach is critical, not just targeting single constraints, but actually trying to integrate the solution across a number of constraints so the value proposition is greater. And then finally, the opportunity for using these mHealth tools to uh, create novel incentive or remuneration strategies. So combining M Finance and M Health systems, I think, is a critical next step that we all need to be exploring. But we also need to be careful about overburdening the frontline health workers as we increasingly look at task shifting as a means of addressing that worker gap. There are sometimes lack, lack of incentives at the frontline health worker level who perceive this uh, technology as an added burden to their already full plate. We just got out of a series of workshops with uh, this year's uh, innovation working group grantees, and it was interesting to hear the feedback from, from field sites from Nigeria all the way to India, where frontline health workers confronted yet again with a new system, a new strategy, really were feeling overwhelmed at times, and how those projects tried to address those uh, feelings was really critical in the success of their deployments. So health systems are complex. We all recognize this. And we have to recognize that change, whether you're talking about the policymaker or the grand, grassroots implementer, can perceive this as a threat. Accountability can be undesirable. We may not want to talk about this elephant in the room, but you're taking systems that were traditionally not very accountable and now introducing a layer of accountability that really shifts that, that relationship between the supervisor and the supervisee. You now know where an individual has been during the course of the day. One of the, the interesting innovations with the Emoka software is that it won't allow you, for example, if you're not within the, the a 50 meter radius of an individual's home, to actually collect data if, in fact, you're trying to do a household survey using that, uh, that instrument. So, so there are layers of accountability that can now be introduced using this technology that can really be undesirable. But increased data flow. So we say more data isn't necessarily better data or more useful information. But it's important to accompany these with better data utilization systems. Who in that frontline health post is going to use that information and what decisions are going to be made based on those uh, systems? So we have to be aware of reportitis. We talk about pilotitis, but I think reportitis is another thing that's coming on the horizon that we should be aware of. And finally, I just want to end with the statement that we do have the technologic capacity. We're growing the evidence base, and many of us in the room are actually working on developing those, that evidence base to support the fact that we can count events. So we no longer have to estimate the number of mothers who die in a country. We can register individuals who are at risk such that we can ensure the equity and delivery of services at that level. And we can support the disconnected frontline health workers, shifting the paradigm from a disconnected health system to a connected health system. We want to engage communities, and we want to work to make the invisible visible. So with that, I thank you very much, and I apologize for the uh, aerobics that your eyeballs have had to do over the past few minutes. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks, Alan. Uh, that's the last time he'll slag off the leprechauns. Um, that was very good, um, and I think a couple of things there that really struck me is the importance of, of registration, real-time reporting, workflow management, data management, and then that whole uh, piece that the technologists are so good at it, at mapping out the workflows and actually doing user engagement studies. So I think really looking at that. So our next speaker is Pam Riley. Pam is a senior mHealth advisor with APT Associates, and she's currently leading an mHealth initiative for USAID. She's 20 years experience, came from the mobile operator sector 20 years ago with Vodafone. Um, she's been a very early advocate of the implementation of using mobile phones for development, particularly around fam family planning and neonatal health. Um, her star sign is cancer, and her favorite color is baby blue, and uh, her, her hobby is collecting fridge magnets. So, <laughs> Okay, 
So this is undo that. So this is not Alan the brief. Should you guys? Okay, that's great. Um, wrong presentation, though. <laughs> it's the uh, second one in the row. This is the first presentation. Maybe you can show the slides again, and they won't jump around. <laughs> exactly. Um, next slide. So my name is Pam Riley. I work for a USAID project called Strengthening Health Outcomes <coughs> Through the Private Sector. And in my talk today, I want to look a little bit at how the private health sector is different. What are the implications for mHealth interventions to support the private sector? And then to do a deep dive into a case study that we recently um, uh, completed in Ghana. Next slide. Oh, I'm sorry, back up one. Um, okay, next slide. <laughs> Why the private sector matters. The bottom line is that uh, more than half of people in low and middle income countries seek health care only from the private sector. Many of them never engage at all with the public health sector. It might be because they're wealthy enough to afford private doctors, private clinics where they perceive higher quality. It may be because the public sector is not available in the communities in which they live. And the two bar charts shown here show that in sub-Saharan Africa, more than 50% get their health care from the private sector. In Southeast Asia, it's above 60%. And these bar charts represent the bottom 20%, the poorest of the poor. So this is not just the wealthy. This is really the people we are most interested in targeting. Next slide. And just to be clear, when we talk about the private sector, it means all players in the health system. Uh, so at the retail level, it might be your street vendors, your hawkers, wherever people go to get their medicines or their, their, um, their treatments. Um, it is all range of providers, midwives, doctors, nurses, traditional healers, and it is facilities of all kinds. Maybe it's an NGO that is just providing family planning or maternity care or secondary or primary care hospitals and clinics across the board. Next slide. So there are three ways in which the private sector needs are really well served by mobiles. And one challenge in the private sector is they are inherently disorganized, fragmented, and diverse. This is not a, you know, tiered public health system where everyone has clear roles and reporting up responsibilities. Many of these are small businesses. They set up shop. They may be credentialed. They may not be. And that is a real challenge when a project like shops goes into a country and says, we want to strengthen the private health sector since that's where people go. Often one of the places shop starts is to go to the professional associations, go to the midwife association, the pharmacy association, the medical association, and say, how can we help you help your members? Who's in your membership? And often these are associations where there is no there there. They don't know who their members are. They don't have meetings. They don't provide value. There's a president that's been a president for about 20 years, and there is an untapped opportunity just simply getting a register of people in a certain uh, cadre of worker, getting their phone number and having text messages sent to them creates a sense of engagement, a system that didn't exist before. So the role of mobiles in the private sector really starts before the training element to create um, a way to engage. Next slide. Uh, other, other direction, there you go. Um, and then the, a second challenge with the private sector is that it often operates in parallel to the public sector, but not in a coordinated way. We often talk to governments and say, how are you tapping the resources of the private sector? 
Uh, is there untapped capacity that you could be leveraging? Uh, could you be targeting the poorest and they could be segmenting different parts of the market? But there's no engagement. There's no conversation. So in one example, SHOPS has been helping the government of Dominica uh, improve their disease surveillance. So we created mobile data collection system in the country of Dominica in which the district health offices submit their weekly disease events via mobile. And we said, how about the private sector? And the government said, no, the private sector won't submit data. So we knocked on the doors of many private providers and said, if we create a really simple mobile platform, would you submit data to the government? And they say, what's in it for us? Why should we? It's one way. We give them, they never give back. So we created an automatic reply to that weekly report in which, for the first time, the private sector is getting a message from the government saying, there were 10 new cases of dengue in the country last week. That is a 5% increase from this time last year. And there's many unexplained skin rashes happening in the southern part of the country. The private sector said, sign us up. We are really interested in beginning this dialogue. So again, it's a channel beyond training that is a very powerful um, opportunity. Next. And then finally, this is where the private sector and the public sector have very similar challenges. How do you improve the quality of care? There's un, uh, not enough resources for training. There is not enough um, ability to address all the skills gaps. And one of the realities about the private sector is many of the trainings that are available are not tailored to their needs. They are not able to leave their business for three-day trainings. So mobile phones can bring the content to them. They are um, likely to have challenges that the public sector doesn't have in terms of uh, business skills, keeping their, their operations more efficient so that they can serve more consumers more efficiently. These are ways in which um, Again, mobile applications can be designed for their needs. Next slide. So I'm going to move now to a Ghana case study. And just to give you a little context, this is a um, project that SHOPS is facilitating the government of Ghana to address pediatric diarrhea, which is the third cause of childhood mortality in Ghana. The WHO, as Alan was saying, has a very proven recommendation of what you do when babies get diarrhea. And it is zinc tablets and oral rehydration salts. That combination both reduces the symptoms of diarrhea and provides a preventative, protective um, uh, treatment that prevents future cases. The reality is that the majority of people seeking diarrhea treatment get antibiotics. Not recommended. It's just an overprescribed reality in many countries. And the government of Ghana wanted to do something about it. So the SHOPS project implemented a very broad range of interventions. It includes demand creation and education on the consumer side finding new suppliers of zinc, making sure that ORS and zinc is on all the shelves. And then, as an additional element, training providers and learning from that opportunity. Next slide. So in Ghana, there are um, licensed pharmacists, but there aren't enough, as in many low-resource countries. So Ghana created this other cadre of lower skilled drug vendors called licensed chemical sellers that are allowed to sell over-the-counter drugs. And they are um, required to be located at least, say, 500 meters from the nearest pharmacy so that they are, they are really serving those areas where there are no pharmacies available. Um, a little bit of preliminary research, these licensed chemical sellers all had mobile phones, but they were very low end, no smartphones, no opportunities to do multimedia. So whatever we were going to do, if we were going to reach them, was going to be text messaging or voice. And um, they were part of um, a licensed 
credentialed group that did come together annually for trainings. So for 2012, the training was on zinc and ORS for pediatric diarrhea. Next slide. We wanted to see whether following up with that training with text messages would actually improve their um, sale of zinc and ORS. If everyone was going to get the same training, here's why zinc and ORS are your prescription of choice, and here's how you should be teaching mothers and other caregivers how to use these products, we then designed a randomized control study in which almost 500 uh, licensed chemical sellers got the training only and another 500 or so got follow-up text messages for eight weeks, about three quizzes a week, just to reinforce what they had learned in the training. Next. Um, in order to collect the data, the research protocol um, used two steps. One was to interview all 900 plus participants in the randomized control trial about their practice and um, behaviors around prescribing for pediatric diarrhea, and then also to send mystery shoppers to every single licensed chemical seller that was part of the trial and to say, my baby has diarrhea, what should I do? The results are just being analyzed. The data has just been uh, cleaned and sent to us, but a very preliminary analysis does show that there is statistically significant better um, compliance with the recommended treatment with the text message group than with the training only group. One of the interesting things we found in this research, though, is after about 10 weeks, those differences disappeared. So one of two things could be happening, and we are still analyzing it. One is that after 10 weeks of the text messages, people start to forget what was in those messages. So it is uh, leading to some recommendations on frequency if you're going to do these interventions. Another possibility is that the control group caught up organically because there were these other things going on in the community with uh, mass media campaigns and detailing from the zinc manufacturers. So whether or not those differences will be sustained, we, uh, we need to look at more closely. Next. So um, stepping back from the real, you know, kind of impact evaluation, we also wanted to look at the implementation science, the new buzzword, of what did we learn about the text message design that we did, and we, we needed to answer that first question of, these are private providers, who the heck is shops to be sending them quizzes? Were they even going to answer them? Are they going to ignore it? We are not, we have no relationship with them. And we were very heartened to um, get very, very positive feedback at the end of the quiz campaign. They said, these were great. They really reminded us of the training. It was great to take the quizzes. Um, keep it coming. And our partner with this was the um, Ghana Pharmacy Council, who is going to continue using this text platform going forward. Next. So um, just two little issues around our um, kind of deep dive into how we designed this. One of the things that we kind of built in right away was we were afraid these private providers wouldn't be engaged in the quizzes. And our assumption was that taking uh, the quiz was going to mean that they really retained the information better, right? It's, it's always better to have education be interactive. So we were monitoring the responses, and we saw in week five, quiz five, there was a fall off in participation. So our initial offer to everyone was, as an incentive to participate in these quizzes, we're going to do a drawing at the end of the eight weeks, and anyone that got five quiz questions correct stands to win free airtime. We then changed at week five and said, let's just give top-ups to everybody that answered any quiz correctly, and we'll do it in chunks of 100 at a time so that we can see, did those top-ups actually lead to more participation in future quizzes? 
In fact, we found very modest differences, and it may be because we were pretty cheap with the top-ups and it wasn't enough to be <coughs> incentivizing. It may be because this was a very short-term intervention, just eight weeks, so maybe they didn't need incentive. It was still novel. But we also found out that Quiz 5 was sent July 2nd, which turns out to be a national holiday in Ghana, and that's kind of why response rate was low. So there were lessons there of assumptions you make going in and then, you know, lessons that you can pull out and share going forward. Next slide. And then um, this is not unique to any of you that have uh, introduced text uh, campaigns in health. Um, what we thought was second nature and, you know, all of the licensed chemical sellers we talked to at the training said, oh, yes, 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 you know, I have a mobile phone, I text. In fact, um, many of them had a lot of challenges responding to the text. Uh, we thought the instructions were incredibly clear. A, a, sim a sample quiz question would be um, the only time to give antibiotics to a child with diarrhea is A, um, whenever they're dehydrated, B, at all times, or C, if there's blood in the stool. Answer shops A, B, or C. And we got back answers shops A, B, or C. Very literal. So it was clear there was more instruction, more training, more, more job aids about how to use these quizzes effectively. We also heard from a lot of people that, yeah, they said they texted, but they don't. If they get a text, they give it to their son or their niece and say, what does this say? So um, really uh, understanding our user community was, was important. But one of the key takeaways from our intervention was that even those who said, I never did really answer the quiz questions, but when you would send the follow-up, because if they didn't answer the question, two days later we sent a follow-up saying, sorry, we didn't hear from you. The correct answer was, C, you should always, you know, use oral rehydration salts. And what they said is they read all of that, even though that they didn't engage. And in fact, those that engaged and those that didn't engage seemed to have pretty similar um, knowledge and behavior change. So uh, again, we need to dig a little deeper into that data. Final slide. So just to wrap up, um, the private sector matters. It's where many of um, the population go for care. There are differences between the private and public health sector when it comes to M Health, and it is still early days designing the right interventions to really address the needs of the private sector. And then the final kind of recommendation and place where SHOPS is pushing wherever we work is to make sure the private sector has a seat at the table when there are these collective uh, public-private partnerships coming together. Often there are the public sector workforce and the technology sector and, um, you know, some of the facilitating groups, but having that private sector there as a voice at the table will really strengthen the health system overall. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Pam. I think one of the interesting things there for me is the, the, the importance of the private sector, particularly in, at the lower end, at the, at the bottom end of the pyramid, and the difficulties that provides for people who have very limited income that such a large portion of the limited um, money they have is used up for, for health care and the challenges of providing low-cost low models, particularly social enterprises in private health care uh, at a primary care level. So uh, our next speaker is Sandy O'Rao. Uh, Sandaya is... is um, the private sector partnership lead in USAID and is presently heading up um, uh, a program she has designed and many of us are involved in the room in empowering frontline health workers, uh, a new public-private partnership with many partners she'll speak about it shortly. Um, she previously was um, the instrumental designer of MAMA, which has been hugely successful and award-winning initiative spoken about here at, at the event. And she's been involved over many years with multiple uh, public-private partnerships and initiatives. Uh, she's originally from the University of Michigan and has an MPH and is also a, a Global Health Fellow. Her, uh, she's a Leo Virgo. Uh, 
a star sign. Uh, her favorite color is cerise pink. And uh, her hobbies include Italian cooking while doing traditional Indian dance and singing. <laughs> right? Sir, Question? Guys, can you? Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Thanks for that. Yeah. Can you can you cut that out, guys? Please. Exactly. How about now? Better? Yeah. Okay, great. Thanks. Um, hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, so I was asked to talk to you uh, today a little bit about scaling M Health through uh, public-private partnerships. I'm going to talk a little bit about a partnership that we catalyzed at USAID called Empowering Frontline Health Workers. And you've uh, already heard uh, from Pam and Alan and Tom a lot about the, the challenges, not only in terms of the global shortage of skilled frontline health workers, but also um, uh, some of the serious challenges they face. I mean, frontline health workers are the first and often the only link to health care for millions of people um, living in the developing world. Um, they are uh, the most immediate and cost-effective way to save lives and improve health. That's a quote from the Frontline Health Workers Coalition, and it is based on, on years of experience and evidence on, on, on the great work that frontline health workers do. Oh, uh, sorry. Um, Next slide. <laughs> Great. Next slide again. <laughs> next, next slide. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs> um, these are some of the challenges. I mean, we've heard uh, again from previous speakers since the advantage of going of going third is is to sort of. Uh, be able to just reiterate what previous speakers have said, but I mean we know that uh, frontline health workers face many challenges uh, in their work, inadequate training, lack of skills and capacity, lack of uh, real-time monitoring, inability to ensure patient adherence to treatment, uh, lack of ability to, to make timely referrals and diagnosis, et cetera. Um, I know many of you in the audience have a lot of experience with that, so it's probably nothing new to you. What, next slide, please. So the challenges are, are many uh, and can often seem insurmountable, um, but many of you together with us at USAID and other donors have seeded um, a lot of innovative solutions, particularly ones that are using mobile technology um, to address these challenges. So, for example, you, you've heard a few of them already, um, SMS and IVR, reminders for health workers, clinical decision support to speed up diagnosis and referral, uh, birth registration, pregnancy tracking, um, real-time monitoring and supervision of health workers. I think um, what's interesting about some of the platforms that, that um, that we see now, like ComCare and, and MoTeC, is, is particularly this, this aspect of health worker supervision and monitoring um, to really uh, help to improve uh, workflow management as well as um, data collection that can actually be used to improve health worker performance and skills. And so in this slide, you see some of the sort of big challenges. And then on the right, you see some of the uh, many ways that, um, at least on a pilot scale, we've started to see applications demonstrate some good results. Um, but we uh, know, despite the fact that there are all these sort of thousand flowers blooming, um, as Alan said earlier, you know, what is the bouquet and what are the prototypes that we really want to be able to scale up? And, and who is needed at the table um, for that conversation. So we started to really think about, um, based on some of the experiences we've had with other partnerships like the Mobile Alliance for Maternal Action, um, what can we actually do? Next slide, please. Um, at scale to improve the performance of frontline health workers. Um, and so we decided to put together this public-private partnership. Um, next slide. 
um, with the hypothesis being that um, uh, what you really need is, is, is multimedia health content that connects through country-based health applications to improve health worker performance. Again, at scale, we're looking at um, not siloed interventions, but actually figuring out how we do this in a way where we are reusing content, we're sharing content, um, we are connecting and integrating to multiple platforms that are interoperable. Um, and I'll get into some of those challenges uh, in a second. Uh-oh. <laughs> okay. Back to the beginning. <laughs> Next slide, please. There you go. Great. Oh. <laughs> Did you catch that? Did you catch that? <laughs> this is a, it's a brain teaser. Um, <laughs> now you see the whole presentation. I don't have to say anything. Yay. <laughs> and done. <laughs> um, well, okay, I'll just talk. Um, so, so through this partnership, we're trying to address a number of barriers to scaling M Health, um, particularly by promoting interoperability, shared standards and terminology, evidence generation for multiple stakeholders, um, reusable tools, technologies, and content, sustainable financing models, private sector engagement, uh, and, and country ownership and leadership. I mean, there's a lot that I can say about each of these. Hopefully, in the Q&A or discussion, if there's time, um, we can take up some of these issues. But um, I know a lot of you are probably facing some of the same challenges. Our goal uh, under the partnership, which is called Empowering Frontline Health Workers, is to end preventable maternal and child deaths by accelerating the use of mobile technology at scale to strengthen the skills and performance of frontline health workers. So we've just started. We just launched it at the Child Survival Call to Action in June. Um, next slide, please. And, um, and, and we have a number of partners um, that are quite diverse. Um, next slide. And so you can skip this one and go to the next one. Thank you. The partners are, there are resource partners who will bring cash and in-kind donations of technology, health content, technical assistance, advocacy partners to create awareness, implementing partners to create and adapt technology solutions, and also to technical advisors that will keep us grounded in practical realities, uh, and research partners um, who, who will be con conducting formative operations and evaluation research, um, not only to, to document and improve what we're learning, but also so um, what, I mean, what we're doing, but also to encourage global learning. So the hypothesis is, you know, that we need many people at the table, a diversity of partners in order to scale, in order to, to really address some of these challenges. Next slide, please. These are the founding partners. Um, they all bring something complementary to the table. It's, it's, it's a pretty amazing group of people. I call this steering committee the Brain Trust. Um, they really, each of, each of the people on the steering committee bring with them a whole host of experience, expertise, networks, resources, um, and, and, and skills to bear on the challenges that we're trying to tackle under this partnership. Um, just to give a couple of examples, the M Health Alliance, of course, everybody knows about them. They're serving as the partnership secretariat for the partnership. Uh, the Precalc Foundation uh, is uh, bringing their communications platforms, both you know, in terms of uh, web-based platforms, but also their amazing communications um, skills and support, including some of the graphics that you see in this presentation. Um, Intel is um, offering their school platform, if you're familiar with that. It's a distance learning platform, um, license-free uh, for this partnership. So there's, so every, every partner is bringing something slightly different to the table, um, and the idea is to have a joint vision, joint work plans um, and in a select number of countries to, to take this forward. This is an overview. Next slide, please of uh, the basic content of what we're trying to do. Um, we're, we're, we're looking to crowdsource um, through partners like IHE, Tom's partner, uh, Tom's organization, um, crowdsource uh, digital, multimedia digital health content and, and, and store it, uh, be able to share it, reuse it, um, 
uh, create a virtual online library that will actually house this data that is a user-friendly, you know, cloud-based platform that uh, various content users can, can use to download different information, um, animations in Swahili on breastfeeding, um, et cetera, you know, very, very narrowly specific raw content. Um, we're also developing a digital dictionary to standard, standardize um, the terminology and, and, and the content to allow for benchmarking and, and comparisons across data. And then at the country level, of course, validating this content, but also integrating the content with technology and, and looking at um, sustainable financing models, so looking at business models that really are um, helping to generate multiple streams of revenue um, such that, you know, uh, the donor funding that we have for this uh, becomes more catalytic as opposed to um, long-term sustaining. Um, next slide, and I think I'll go to the next one after that. So what's new about this? Um, uh, we are in the process, and we have sort of a, a few ideas for why this is new and would love to, to hear from, from all of you. Um, we're actually in, uh, currently in the middle of an, uh, in a consulting engagement with um, Vital Wave with Brendan Smith, who's here in the audience, um, to help us think through a strategy for what this um, health content library looks like. But um, so far, it seems that at least in terms of raw digital content, this ha hasn't been done before in terms of an actual cloud-based platform. So. We think that this is new, the, the multimedia crowdsourced co health content library. Replicable and scalable mHealth solutions for training, motivating, supervising, and supporting frontline health workers. Um, again, the hypothesis that multiple partners will facilitate the scale up of prov proven solutions beyond the pilot. And then um, what we're really excited about is this global learning platform to accelerate adoption through peer-to-peer -peer learning and exchange uh, amongst mHealth and global health practitioners. So um, next slide, and I think I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thanks, Andaya. Um, there'll be plenty of opportunities to discuss this uh, partnership afterwards, so um, we look forward to some robust discussions with everybody. Our final speaker, and uh, she's been very patient in waiting, uh, is Eunice Namarembe, uh, who's a Ugandan national, um, is program manager for Text to Change, um, and a number of the people from Text to Change are here in the audience. They're involved in uh, a lot of um, text initiatives across 12 African countries and two South American countries and have reached uh, a huge number of people over, over um, quite a significant uh, number of years with their initiatives. Um, she is a, a quali qualified from Makerere University in, in Kampala and um, in a bachelor's degree in economics and in statistics. So don't ask any difficult questions on maths or you'll be in trouble. Um, and she is particularly interested in behavioral change uh, education and uh, very interested in new media. So I'll hand over uh, to Eunice. Sorry, her star sign is Aries and her favorite color is blue. And uh, she lists her hobbies as work, work, and more work. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> I'm here to sort of like affirm uh, Alan's presentation that what he talked about is possible. Today I'm going to speak about a program we are doing with Malaria Consortium in Uganda. Um, it's, it's still ongoing, so I really don't have results, but so far what we've done shows that uh, it's very possible to use technology to support community health workers. In Uganda at the moment, the community health workers we use are called village health teams. Now, the village health team members are people that some of them are stopped maybe in primary school, but they're there to support the community. The, um, when Malaria Consortium was working with them before, they had to uh, give uh, information especially about the integrated care, uh, community care management form. But uh, they, they used to go uh, from health facility to health facility to collect this information. And since they were in very deep down in communities, and in Africa, of course, some communities are cut off by floods and a number of other things, so they couldn't send these forms timely to the Ministry of Health or even to um, companies like uh, Malaria Consortium. So Malaria Consortium came to us 
and we came up with a, a, a system called the InScale Mobile VHT system. Next slide, please. And uh, it's a partnership with Malaria Consortium, London School of Hygiene uh, and Tropical Medicine, University College of London. And you'll see that at least each of those partners has a role to play in this program. And uh, the funders are Bill and Melinda Gates, and we are the technical implementers in Uganda. We are working in eight districts. It's sort of, I wouldn't say it's a pilot, but we're starting with the eight districts to see how it goes and how the village health teams work, and then it, it will go to scale. And the mobile technology solution is using mobile phones to facilitate and coordinate data collection and also to facilitate um, more uh, dialogue between the supervisors, the VHT supervisors and the VHTs down in the, in the community. So uh, as you can see, it is, we, want to be able to, we want to be able to give a platform or an easy way, a mobile technology tool for the VHTs to report on the ICCM and be able to still communicate among each other. Next slide, please. Um, before we went ahead, there was some there was formative research that was carried out, and then the findings were that we found that the VHTs were lacking motivation, and no one was actually supervising them. They had all these uh, indicators that they had to meet, but no one was supervising them, and they lacked motivation to go on and give this information. They were not getting feedback, and then the VHT supervisors had could not reach the VHTs down in the community easily. They didn't even know their phone numbers. So if th th there was a gap between the supervisors and the VHTs down in the community. And the, it, was, it was very hard to have regular supply of medicines and VHT supply, uh, VHT, VHTs. And uh, receiving timely feedback from the Ministry of Health was very difficult. Next slide, please. Sorry, next slide. The next one. So the program aims, uh, we, want to boost, we wanted to boost uh, ICCM VHT motivation and to find that to, the one, we want them to have job satisfaction and retention. It's very hard for, of course, the VHTs to have job satisfaction. They're not being paid at the moment, and it's like it's voluntary work. So how do we motivate them to be able to give us the data that we need, but also to be able to carry out their work uh, very efficiently. We also want to promote collective identity and, and support. We want, them to we want them to feel that they are being recognized in community, and together with this program we felt that if we give them a mobile phone and other incentives and be able to also encourage them using motivational SMSs, this would boost uh, their role in, in carrying out their work. Next, Next slide, please. So the mobile technology solutions we came up with, uh, we created uh, closed user groups. The, how the closed user group work, works is there's a supervisor, and then there are different VHTs in the, in the district, and together by SMS they can communicate free of charge within that closed user group, and also call each other free of, free of charge. So the supervisor is able to place appointments of when they are going, she, she or he is going to visit the, 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 the community. Or they can even talk about uh, medicine uh, supply has run out, please come to my community and provide this and that. They can also make referrals using uh, that closed user group uh, free of charge, calling an SMS. Then the next uh, mobile technology tool we, we came up with was the mobile phone weekly data submission of the ICCM form. So what they have is a Nokia phone that is Java enabled, and then there's a software through which they can share this information via SMS or GPRS. Why we, want, why we think it's SMS and GPRS is because some communities, there's no GPRS. So there's a way the software has been integrated to send this information via SMS, even when GPRS is not there. Then we, we are going to send monthly motivation, uh, motivational SMSs. That's an example of the SMSs. And of course the extras that they have are the solar lanterns and the charger that helps them, of course, uh, in case there is no electricity in the community to charge the mobile phone. Next slide, please. Um, this is uh, the way the data is going to flow. As you know, in Uganda right now there's a moratorium and they want all the data to do with patient and anything like forms or HMIs to sit at the Ministry of Health. So the challenge that we had, and I will explain that after, is 
we had to make sure that we build a system whereby all this information first settles at the Ministry of Health before it's shared on another server, maybe Malaria Consortium or the London School of, of, of Hygiene. So as you can see, there is a weekly phone submission of data by the village health teams, but then also they, they receive feedback from the server telling them, thank you very much, we've received your information. And then they can also receive any other information that they will come up with according to the data. If the data has been analyzed and evaluated, they can still receive any information that comes through the server. Then there's the automated SMS flagging in case uh, the supervisor notices that there's a gap in the information that they've, they've, they've submitted, then they, they'll be able to send the information to the server, then the server will communicate to the village health team. As you can see, also the district-based statistician has uh, access to the information. That means also the Ministry of Health has access to the information. And there's a monthly summary statistics that is uh, accessible to the biostatistician. The information that the village health team shares, they cannot see it in the server, but they will get only timely updates in case there is analysis and evaluation. So the information is still private to, for the Ministry of Health, only to be accessed by the Ministry of Health and the Health Facility Supervisor. And down here what we see is the calls and alerts and, and uh, the supervisor communicating to the village health teams and it closes the loop and there's the closed user group uh, discussion going on. Next slide, please. This is just um, uh, an, uh, the client application architecture. As you can see, we have the Java-enabled phone, uh, which is a Nokia phone, and then we have the client application that, that passes through SMS. So we are using two, two applications, uh, two tools, that's the SMS and GPRS. And if GPRS fails in most parts of the community, if it fails, then definitely the, inf the, S the information will be got by SMS. Next slide. I'll just talk about a few benefits, the benefits of the in-scale mobile VHT system. At least we have timely referral systems. We are expecting to see timely referral systems. Uh, the way it is right now in the communities in Uganda, it's very hard to refer a patient unless you have a mobile phone to call and see whether the nurse is actually at the community health center. Because the, the community health centers don't have a regular supply like of medicines and may, even the doctor sometimes is not there. But with this mob, with the, with, with the closed user group and, the, and, and uh, the village health teams having a mobile phone, they can be able to call and see that there's a nurse before they even refer someone to the, to the clinics. Then there's, we're expecting at least improved performance of VHTs. We are expecting that giving them a mobile phone will motivate them to do their work much better and also give us data from the community in a timely way. And then there's, we expect weekly performance feedback. The ICCM uh, data is supposed to be received weekly, but what, what is there right now is that we're receiving it even after six months, and definitely that is not very helpful for the Ministry of Health to make analysis and evaluation of what's happening in the community. We expect timely detection of low medicine stockouts and so that they can be able to take these medicines down to the community. Next slide, please. Um, the implementation, uh, we're targeting 1,200 ICCM trained VHT members. That's a very big number to train, uh, given that the VHTs don't all understand English. So we have had to also make the training manuals in a language that they understand. The training also is done in a language that they'll, they'll understand. And then we've also trained 46 VHT supervisors in the eight districts. The duration of the program is 18 months. Of course, uh, we've been really delayed, especially by the moratorium. The Ministry of Health has to approve each and every step that we go. So that has really been delayed. We're, we are still halfway the program, yet we are supposed to be like three quarters into the program. Next slide, please. So the implementation milestones, we've trained the VHTs, like I've said. We've provided the mobile phones and the solar charger usage policy guidelines. Why we need those guidelines is because some of the village health teams don't have a phone. And then if you give them the phone, they might disappear. So we we'll have to give them guidelines on, on how to use this mobile phone. If it's broken down, where do you go? And if you disappear with it, we have GPS to track you and all that. So. <laughs> We provided them with user manuals, which we've also put in the language that they understand and how to use uh, them. Then the collection of VHT mobile numbers and verification. 
uh, what Malaria Consortium had was a database and they were very proud of it that it has all those VHTs that they want to reach but via our call center we called up all these numbers to verify the location and whether they are still actually VHTs and they work for the community. Sometimes there's relocation from one community to another. So via the call center we called them up and we we were able to find out all this data about the VHTs before we started rolling out the program. Then we conducted an in-house trial of the software, which was very successful, and now we're starting with a few districts already to, to implement. We created SMS content messages, and we've tested them already. Uh, we inform, uh, we, have, we are asking for, we are still asking for permission from the Ministry of Health and really verifying that actually this data is going to sit at the Ministry of Health database. And then we have we've conducted an, a research on the network provider. In Uganda, well, we're going to use MTN. So we went to each and every district to find out what is the best network provider that we can have because we have very good maps that show us that, oh, yeah, in, uh, we have the network covering the whole country, but actually when you go down to the community, the network is not there. Then we have purchased and distributed the mobile technology tools to the VHDs. Next slide, please. So the technology tools are the Nokia C200 mobile phone. It's, it's a dual SIM card phone. That means that if a VHT already has a, a mobile phone, all they have to do is that they get a SIM card and just add it to the already existing SIM card that we are giving them. We've branded the mobile phone, so they cannot say that it's theirs. We've branded it that uh, it's in-scale malaria consortium program. So it, it also differentiates it from may, may, maybe any other mobile phone um, project that they may be having. Then because to, to curb the uh, rural electrification uh, challenges, we've given them the solar lantern. So the good thing with the solar lantern is that it also motivates them because if, if there's no electricity, then they can be able to still have, you know, some electricity in the house as, as, as long as they, they're able to charge this phone. Next slide, please. Um, the lessons learned have been very interesting. Uh, of course, if we have the moratorium right now, it's, 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 we, if we have to ask them to approve every program and then it takes about two years to approve this program, they are very, that, that delays the process. We really need the moratorium and it's a very good innovation, but we don't want it to again stifle innovation in the process of wanting to make sure that there are not very many pilots that look this alike, alike in the country. That has really stifled uh, some of the innovations that have come up in Uganda. Then uh, we found that the VHT is shifting to using mobile phones. The, they are very used to carrying around the papers. It, it makes them feel proud if they're seen with a file and a, and a pen and, you know, uh, making them to shift to the mobile phone is a bit difficult and you find that they for, still forget. They go with the, with the paper, uh, record all the information and then start using the phone. Yet our initial thinking was they would go with the mobile phone directly and, and input this data. So. Is that it, it's, it's sort of like still becoming double work for them and we, the shifting is taking some time. Then the complex data flow system uh, takes time to build. At the moment, of course, there are three different servers that this information has to sit and be uh, uh, analyzed and evaluated. That, that can take some time to, to build. Then I'm wondering, shall we stop at the pilot? Because most of the mHealth programs that look very interesting like this always stop at a pilot and then the community health workers are stuck. We are stuck with 1,200 phones that have a very good software and then you ask yourself, so what, what's the next step? But I hope that since this is a program that is built on research and, and very interesting findings, we can go on to the next phase and of scale up. Then the zero electrification problems, those ones cannot easily be solved. You'll always find them in Africa. So step, step by step, we, we are getting there, but those are some of the things that you still need to put in your plan if you're going to work with community health workers and giving them a smartphone that can only last a few hours. Then uh, the level of education of VHTs, uh, not, not all VHTs, and I would say maybe about 30% uh, are, are very illiterate to, for, for you to work with. So you, you might find a challenge working with some of the VHTs. 
then the work overload for VHTs. There are very many programs that want to work with VHTs. You might find a VHT with about four phones and they're collecting data. So <laughs> how, how important, how best are you going to use these VHTs? If you're giving them a mobile phone, and another one is giving them a smartphone, another one is, giving, is calling them via a call center, and then another one is sending them SMS messages, that's, that's becoming very confusing at the moment, and that's also a very big challenge. They have to report on each and each, every program. They are seated in trainings every the other day, and they are going for workshops and meetings. So there's uh, now VHT work overload at the moment. Next slide. Um, I'll, I'll just explain text to change works in Africa in 12 countries, like they've explained, and we build simple, simple and powerful solutions, uh, mobile for solutions, build software that works in Africa and that can use local content and it can be used in any other language. We have a platform that we've developed that sends SMS and we send, uh, we do voice systems and IVR and we have a very flexible SMS system. Thank you very much. Thanks Eunice and that's a very practical display of of the challenges there are in the field around uh, simple things like electrification, education levels of community health workers, uh, getting permission from ministries uh, to roll out projects and moratoriums, etc. So we'll quickly move on to some questions from the floor. Um, I'm conscious we started 10 minutes late, so we've got about 10 minutes for questions. So, uh... Hi, Betty Jordan from Johns Hopkins School of Nursing. And Pam, I, this question's for you. You talked a little bit about integrating the healthcare providers into some of the strategies, but one thing I found missing in the presentations was the really the inclusion of midwives and nurses, which make up a lot of the workforce when you think about workforce capacity. So I didn't know if you could maybe share what you might see as some strategies to better engage midwives around the world and nurses into some of the implementation of, of some of the programs that were discussed today. Can you, can you hear? Yeah. Um, thank you for the question, <coughs> Betty. Um, I think the issue with regard to midwives would not be different than any other cadre of private sector, so you kind of start with what are their needs? Are the midwives feeling connected to one another? Would they benefit from, you know, a, a, a more cohesive <coughs> mobile communications platform they could talk to each other and get, um, get feedback from whoever their credentialing or training or organizing body is? Um, I know that there are a number of midwife programs, I believe in the Philippines, which is texting capital of the world, that do make use of uh, some of those interventions, but I'm not sure if I answered your question. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. My name again is Eugene. I, I am from Nigeria. Uh, the question is for Sanjay Rao. The partners you put up there in your presentation, all of them seems like donors, and you call them private partners. Um, if there are donors, international donors, rather than partners from the private sector, is the, uh, the empowering program really sustainable? And if it will, if it is, how will it be? Then the issue of, uh, this is the question for Eunice, the VTS, the VHTs. I think for sustainability, using them only for malaria will really make the program stop at a certain point. I would think that since they, you, you've trained they, that large number and it takes like 18 months to train a VT, VHT uh, it would be better to integrate other services like them reporting uh, um, maternal, uh, ma reporting on maternal and child health issues in addition to just malaria. I think so. It's just a comment and a suggestion. Thank you. Thank you. 
Okay, thank you so much for your question. So um, one of the things that we've learned uh, with these partnerships is when partnering with the private sector, the private corporate sector, um, it's important to uh, look at two types of funding. One is sort of the corporate philanthropic dollars and the other is the actual business side. And so with most of the corporate partners that we're partnering with, we're actually looking, we're partnering with the business side. So, um, and we're not looking to, make the partnership sustainable, we're looking to catalyze sustainable services on the ground in these countries. And by engaging the private sector in terms of um, their sort of business um, interests, we believe that is ultimately going to be more scalable and sustainable. Thank you very much, Eugene. Uh, at the moment, the ICCM reports on malaria, diarrhea, and pneumonia. So those are the three main diseases that they're reporting on. And then later, I think after the pilot, we're going to go to other diseases as well. Thank you. Um, my name is Emeka. I am from, I'm equally from Nigeria. And for some reason, um, the, the application or the projects we are piloting in Nigeria, I work with Pathfinder International, sorry. The application we are piloting in Nigeria has um, a similar um, look to what you are doing. And I, I just have a couple of questions. Yeah, w the application we're working on um, using um, Comcare to, uh, as a decision support system for community health workers to conduct antenatal services. But then I, I I share some of the challenges that you share, and I just wanted to um, understand one for the C close user group that you talked about. You said, it, it, and it's free for them to text into the close user group. What it means is that you are paying um, for it. Am I right? Okay. And I just wanted to know how you are looking at that when it comes to sustainability. And the other thing is um, the resistance. Thing of um, when for the, the community health workers to change from using their paper-based system to um, the electronic system and you have to consistently supervise them like on a weekly basis or monthly if not more frequently for you to get them to use it and when you stop doing that they are likely going to go back to their old system um, okay. there, there are two ways. It could be you could either decide to um, give them an incentive or um, I don't know. But then I, I think I'm just trying to think of an easier way to make them maybe something to make them want to use either the application or the method you are proposing. I don't know. That's, those are my questions. Um, thank you very much. For the community health workers to subscribe to the closed user group, it costs them a, a minimum of about one dollar, by the way. So that is very sustainable for them, I'm sure. So that is the cost. It's, it's very low to subscribe to a closed user group. And you can even have a partnership with the mobile telecom providers and, and talk to them about the health, uh, impl the health program that you're doing. I'm very sure they can, add, they can be able to give you a very good a package for if you're going to do something to do in health. And another thing is uh, the incentives. The, we're, we're going to use social incentives and also airtime incentives. The social incentives is if you've given all the, the information um, in a timely way, then automatically the system will send you an, um, a message, an SMS, th thanking you that maybe you are the, thank you very much, you're the first to give, you know, or congratulations, you're the first to, g to give us your data. And then we also shall give them uh, airtime incentives as well. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Eunice. Um, I'm afraid we're, we're all out of time, so we can't take any more questions. I'd just like to thank everybody for your patience and on your behalf uh, to thank the panel. I'd just like to mention a report that many of you involved were involved in uh, earlier this year called uh, Preparing the Next Generation of Community Health Workers, the Power of Technology for Training, which was funded by MDG Alliance and Mobile Health Alliance and was carried out by ourselves at IHEED. Um, I have a synopsis of it here in an info, inf what's it called? infographic, uh, if people would like to get a copy of it, which highlights the details of the report. Uh, and thank you all, and enjoy the rest of the summit. Thank you.